from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Building a career out of brewing. Being able to, to put out a product that you can say you had a hand in, in making. How one university is turning distilling into a degree. A vital resource in short supply. It's completely open. There is no water, as you can see. How farmers in New Mexico are trying to protect their crops against drought and wildfires. Spring planting turns into a costly undertaking. Uh, the diesel fuel aspect, yeah, you're looking at double price as well, so um, at least, if not more. As fuel prices hit new records, right now on Ag Day. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. The national average for a gallon of gas right now continues to climb, and there appears to be no end in sight. AAA reporting regular unleaded hit another record high on Thursday with the national average topping $4.58 a gallon. Now in California, it's $6 a gallon, the highest in the nation. And get this, JP Morgan this week said $6 a gallon is a real possibility for the rest of the nation this summer. Diesel hitting a record price this week as well. On Wednesday, it shot up to $5.57 a gallon. Ag Day National Reporter Michelle Rook joins us. And Michelle, planting right now turning into an expensive endeavor. It certainly is, Clinton. This past winter, when most farmers put together their balance sheets for 2022, they were already facing near record prices for most inputs from fertilizer to herbicides, but few plan for these record high diesel fuel prices. Hull, Iowa farmer Craig Moss faced sticker shock when he went to fill his fuel tanks at the farm recently. He says prices are four times what he paid in 2020 at the height of the pandemic. Fuel, we had some farm diesel delivered yesterday and it cost us 485 or 489 a gallon delivered. So two years ago we bought fuel for just over a dollar. He says he's never seen diesel fuel prices this high in his farming career. When was it that diesel you know, gas prices got wild last? I don't think it was this high though. I think we probably paid in the threes for farm fuel, but not four and definitely not close to five. Moss says that's putting a squeeze on his operation. And the same is true for Minden, Iowa farmer Kevin Ross. Uh, the diesel fuel aspect, yeah, you're looking at double price as well. So um, at least, if not more. So. Um, just big prices, big, uh, you know, big numbers that you're that you're paying with these bills. The only silver lining is these high fuel and input prices are being somewhat offset by historically high grain prices. But uh, on the bright side, we do have, you know, we've got good prices for the crop that we're hopefully going to harvest too. So if we can keep those things in check, then, you know, hopefully it'll still be a good year around here. The historic run-up in diesel is tied to a 30-year low in supplies with global sanctions against Russian oil, but also lower refinery production on the East Coast. Now, this unfortunately means prices may not have reached their peak yet. All right, thanks, Michelle. In New Mexico, firefighters are battling the largest wildfire in its history, which has burned 300,000 acres. Now, currently in a severe drought, the state just issued an unprecedented order mandating farmers in some areas stop irrigating their crops, quote, in the interest of public safety to make water resources available for wildfire activity. Renee Marsh reports. Right now, all these sprinklers will be running. Michael Quintana is a third generation farmer near Las Vegas, New Mexico. It's completely open. There is no water. As you can see, right now we have it completely open and there is no water coming up. All of his irrigation lines are dry. The wildfire is miles away from his 600 acre farm, and yet it will wipe out all of his crops because of the state order mandating he temporarily give up his water rights. Have you thought about what that means to your bottom line? Uh, it's, it's non-existent at that point. We, we have no revenue from this farm. The water stopped flowing to this farm just four days ago, and this canal used to be full, but now it's just down to a puddle, and you still see the water line from where the water used to be. This was the canal before the state stopped water flow to his property. You have no idea how long you'll have to forego using your water or give up no. your water rights. Wait, there's, it could be months. It could be years. New Mexico's early, more intense fire season is sparking fear that extended firefighting activity could significantly deplete the area's dwindling water supply. It's actually in the forefront of my mind, um, you know, that uh, another catastrophe could be taxing on our water supply. 
Eleven large wildfires are currently burning across the U.S. So far, more than 1.2 million acres have burned, more than double the same period last year. Happening right now, a late season winter storm is bringing up to a foot of snow in Colorado. And what a week it's been for the state, with temperatures moving from the upper 80s, along with facing critical fire concerns, to temperatures in the 30s and heavy snow, with the heaviest bands bringing snow to the Rockies. But it was also falling in the foothills of Boulder. Meteorologist Andrew Wimmeyer is in for Matt today. And Andrew, talk about a change. There's also potential for frost in the northern plains. Yeah, quite the powerful cold front that is going to swing through uh, late this week and into this weekend. And in fact, again, we are talking frost potential for parts of the northern plains as we round out uh, this upcoming weekend. Temperatures behind us, though, for this Friday morning. We're still watching that heat and humidity, though, building on in for much of the deep south midwestern states. And this eventually is going to move on up across the New England states as well. Let's take a look at those high temperatures for this Friday afternoon. Notice lots of 80s and 70s building on in and even 90s as well. Uh, but take a look at this Friday afternoon. Notice the Amarillo at 86 degrees and you just go north and west of there to Denver. Temperatures today are only going to top out in the upper 30s. And with this strong of a cold front, as you would expect, there will be a few strong to severe thunderstorms developing for today, lingering right on up into Friday into that uh, tan shaded area where we could be looking at a few stronger storms. But take a look at this wintry side of the system. We're talking snow for parts of the inner mountain west. In fact, if we zoom on in to parts of the Rockies there up into Colorado, we're going to be measuring the snowfall likely in feet as we go throughout this weekend. And this was a welcome sight in the Texas Panhandle. The area finally seeing some rain. Scott of Spearman taking this video saying he was thankful for it and it looks like it was a heavy rain too. There's a chance for more rain next week and I'll now, firefighters worked for several days to put out a fire that damaged an ethanol plant in South Peoria, Illinois. Investigators say a grain silo imploded at the Bayerja Group ethanol plant in central Illinois last week. Now, that fire sending two employees to the hospital and forcing the plant to close. The cause of the explosion is not known. Bayerja is an energy and ag commodity trading group based in Houston. It bought the dry mill corn ethanol plant from Archer Daniels Midland Company late last year. Now, company officials say so far the damage appears to be isolated to the grain silos and storage areas of the facility. Four Senate Democrats are introducing a bill to stop mergers creating big ag companies. The senators introducing the Food and Agribusiness Merger Moratorium and Antitrust Review Act of 2022. The bill would establish a commission to study merger enforcement and antitrust oversight in the farm and food sectors. They say the moratorium would be lifted once Congress acts on the recommendations from the commission. Now they say they want Congress to address the problems of growing market concentration in the ag sector. Backing the plan are Senators Cory Booker of New Jersey, John Tester of Montana, Jeff Merkley of Oregon, and Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts. Commodities and financial markets appear to head in diverging directions. We'll discuss that next. And later, meet a Kentucky graduate making waves and bourbon thanks to a new college degree in the country. Signs of weakness may be surfacing in the rural economy. That's according to the May Rural Main Street Index from Creighton University. The overall index fell to its lowest level since February of last year to a reading of 57.7. That's still above growth neutral where it's been for 18 straight months. Approximately 40% of rural bankers expect farm income this year to be greater than last year, with almost 26% saying it will be less this year. Now, Ernie Goss, who conducts the survey, says, much like the nation, the growth of the rural Main Street economy is slowing. He says supply chain issues continue to constrain growth. Garrett Toy with Ag Trader Talk joining us. Uh, Garrett, as we look at these overall grain markets, obviously uh, the, the situation remains uh, pretty bullish given where we're at with planting and what's going on in Ukraine and, and kind of the global uh, situation. But you look at the, the economy here in the U.S., and that's kind of a different story. How do we weigh all of those risk factors together? Absolutely. You know, I know that we have a bullish, uh, you know, even, you know, our, our commentary has kind of been more 
you know, conservative in here as far as marketing, um, sticking more to seasonals, even though we have prices where, you know, from a producer standpoint, where $7 out of, out of the field is, is pretty hard to ignore. Um, but the situation is bullish, but we're caught between the situation where uh, we could have outside influences upset the apple cart here. And, and that's the thing that kind of concerns me. Uh, the negative GDP numbers, the rising interest rates, um, you know, the the equity markets this week trading new calendar year lows. Um, you know, I think that, you know, at the back of everyone's mind is a, another 2008 type situation where, you know, it's kind of out of our control, even though uh, the situation is, is, uh, is friendly and greens. Now, again, you know, that... Are we are we going to go to complete collapse? Probably not, because I mean, obviously, we have uh, the 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 the, uh, the food shortage issues globally. Um, you know, this the general shortages, but that's going to create um, you know windfalls lower and 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 recoveries that we've seen even the last thirty days. Uh, but that's going to make it very difficult. So I think the you know the the thing is to stick to your plan. Um, you know, it, you'll use some options that. Uh, you know, that give you some flexibility. Uh, don't, you know, maybe move away from, you know, getting tied to, you know, HTAs or cash sales and things of that sort, uh, if you can. Uh, not everyone is like that, you know, our, our cash markers, but, you know, maintain your flexibility because these markers are gonna be extremely fluid. Yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of risks out there beyond just uh, what we have day to day here in our commodity markets. Garrett, sure appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here. We'll be back with more Ag Day coming up in just a minute. To contact Garrett, call him at 888-745-2020 or find him at agtradertalk.com. It's time to sign up for the 2022 United Pork Americas Conference in Orlando, Florida. Register today at unitedporkamericas.com and join us September 7th through the 9th. Meyer joining us here, taking a look at our national forecast. And as we talk about the weather, boy, it's a little bit of a tale of, of two cities here. We've got on the east and out west completely different climates. Yeah, Mother Nature has really given us kind of a cocktail shake up today. Again, we've got kind of that summer pattern off to the east, more of that winter pattern shaping up for parts of the northern plains as well as the Intermountain West. And we're there, again, they're going to be measuring snow in Colorado up in the feet, up in the mountains. And here's a closer look at that map again, showing kind of the temperature tantrum that uh, Mother Nature is going to provide with us uh, for this uh, Friday and into Saturday. Again, we're tracking that severe weather along that cold front. Meanwhile, again, a winter you've seen is going to set up across the inner mountain west, where again, they could be looking at uh, some several inches of snowfall over the course of the next uh, three days. And here's a closer look at that cold front. Notice 80s and 90s ahead of that front. Meanwhile, high temperatures are going to struggle to make it up into the 50s for this afternoon. And as we take a look at this weekend, that cold front marches off towards the east and that cooler air begins to filter on in here as we go throughout the weekend across much of the lower 48 and where that heat was, that cooler air, that refreshing weather builds on in here for the second half of the weekend. And we're going to continue that to cooler pattern into Tuesday of next week with that still that dip in the jet stream. But watch what happens as we get towards the Memorial Holiday weekend. We've got this upper level ridge that's going to build on in here, and that's going to bring with it heat and humidity once again for much of the lower 48 as we head on into the Memorial Holiday weekend. Let's look at the U.S. drought monitor for the rest of the United States here. We're going to continue to see again those drought conditions expanding across parts of the plain states as again we're going to be looking at a drier pattern to set up across the plain states. And meanwhile, again, we're looking at more rainfall here across uh, much of the uh, eastern half of the U.S. here. And again, this all depends really on uh, where scattered showers and thunderstorms do decide to bubble on up here. But nonetheless, we could be looking at additional rainfall amounts anywhere from a half inch to upwards of two inches of rain as we head on into uh, next week. Uh, looking at the jet stream for today, Again, we continue to watch that cold front working its way off uh, towards the east and all eyes on the secondary front. That's going to bring with it some cooler air and this high pressure is going to continue to build on in here. And with that area of high pressure, that's going to lead to a few pockets of frost potential across the parts of the northern plains and the upper portions of the Midwest as we head on into Saturday right on into Sunday. Let's take a look a little bit closer to home at our selected towns for today. Green Valley, Illinois warm and humid a few scattered showers and thunderstorms late in the day 
High 86 degrees, Aylwood, partly cloudy, showers late and going over into Oregon, sunny and chilly. Your next piece of equipment is on MachineryPete.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineryPete.com. President Biden is invoking the Defense Production Act in order to speed production of infant formula. Now it comes as the president faces mounting political pressure over a shortage in the U.S. of formula. It was caused by the safety-related closure of the country's largest formula manufacturing plant. The order is expected to help formula makers get ingredients more quickly. But the president has also authorized the Defense Department to use commercial aircraft to fly formula supplies from overseas to the U.S. And two bills are heading to the Senate after passing the House. One would help low-income families use their WIC benefits for formula. The other would pay for more FDA inspectors at formula plants. U.S. dairies appear to be producing a little less milk than they did this time last year, and there are fewer cows than a year ago. The latest milk production report from USDA puts April's output at 19.2 billion pounds. That's close to 1% lower than a year ago. The milk cow herd down by 98,000 from April last year, but unchanged from March of this year. But the milk per cow is the same from a year ago. We're seeing cow numbers that were unchanged from March. That's supportive to the market because we saw a huge increase uh, the previous month. And uh, that's, that's unusual to see that much of a difference and not see any real, real uh, change this month, but it's not unheard of. And the other thing is production per cow. We were unchanged on production per cow in the 50 states, one pound below a year ago in the 24 states. Again, that coupled together with the cow numbers being unchanged is supportive to the market. New graduates are thinking about their future careers. In Kentucky, that future could lead you to bourbon. We'll tell you about a program turning out the next generation of distillers in the country. The bourbon industry in Kentucky is booming. To help keep barrels full, the University of Kentucky and the James B. Beam Institute offer a certificate in distilling wine and brewing. It's a commitment by the institution to provide a stable supply of workers. And the UK's Jeff Franklin reports the program now has its first lead distiller. Cody Giles graduated from the University of Kentucky in 2017, earning the distilling wine and brewing certificate in his degree program and went to work at the James Pepper Distillery in Lexington. The Pepper Distillery, a well-known name in Lexington distilling history, had been closed for about 50 years it when owner Amir Pei resurrected it. And I just became intrigued with the story and the brand and thought it would be very cool to relaunch this classic piece of Americana. And brought Cody on board before the distillery even began operations. And Cody really was such a talent right out of school uh, and really showed a great dedication and a desire to work in the industry and to work here at this distillery. And he's been here ever since, every day, showing up, working hard, uh, and just has developed into such a great talent that we are so happy to have him on the team now and so excited about the future with him. This gathering of students in the DWB program to celebrate the end of a successful school year was held at Pepper, and to informally announce, Giles was now Pepper's head distiller. Giles said he was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time, but he also gave credit to the program. A lot of the, the professors that are in the program are really passionate about the industry too and really want to help, help uh, the students find work and really career paths if they want to pursue it. He was already there, it was just making the connections and he had found that passion and that interest himself and um, the canvas that this program creates for people like that is, um, we're, we're, that's what we want to keep building. Giles, a Kentucky native, was a chemical engineering major and discovered the distilling wine and brewing certificate program his sophomore year and thought this could be a career path for him. After four and a half years at Pepper, he is now 
the head distiller. Satisfied when I'm putting my hands to use, doing some, some manual labor, and then being able to, to put out a product that you can say you had a hand in, in making, you made pretty much in every stage of its production. You can be really proud about something. From the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food, and Environment, I'm Jeff Franklin. All right, thanks, Jeff, and that's all the time we have this morning. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day. Alan Farkas.